Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is our first group uh, live stream for Ray Law International. My name's Anthony Ray. I'm one of the attorneys here at Ray Law International. And um, we uh, service uh, clients throughout the United States and throughout the world through our three offices. Uh, we have our offices located in New Jersey, Chicago, and Michigan. I've been practicing for a little over 20 years, and um, I'm going to turn it over to um, our next host, Lauren. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the attorneys here at Ray Law. Uh, it's nice to be doing this in English, so I can actually speak pretty fluently. Um, I've been practicing immigration for about six years. I've been with the firm, I think about four years now. Um, so we're happy to have you. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section and we'd be happy to address them for you. Hogan? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Hogan. Um, I'm a legal assistant here at Ray Law. Uh, I'll be here uh, moderating the discussion and, and, and reading any questions you guys may have uh, for our host today. Okay, um, Hogan, go ahead. Um, start off with the, the light light question to start off today. So let's start with a low ball for Lauren. <laughs> uh, so uh, who is uh, H-1B visa category oh, for? Before that, about oh. us. Oh. What's our favorite dessert? Oh. We gotta start with something before we get into business. <laughs> so I'll start off. My favorite dessert, um, just a little bit about me. Um, I enjoy uh, apple pies. Um, here in Michigan, we have a lot of apples and this is the best time for apples. I also enjoy chocolate chip cookies. How about you, Lauren? I uh, stole my answer. I would say apple pie. I like sprinkles, cupcakes, I guess. Here in okay. Chicago. Hogan, how about you? I'm not really much of a dessert person, um, but I'll I'll eat ice cream. I mean, watching a movie. Uh, I like to have my popsicles or anything lemon or lime flavored. Uh, usually is the way to go. All right, all right. Let's jump into it. Go ahead, Hogan. Okay. So uh, the first question. Uh, so who is the H-1B visa category for? And this was for Lauren. Yeah, so the H-1B visa category is for anyone who is a professional, which means you would have at minimum a bachelor's degree. Uh, technically, the rules also allow for equivalent experience, however, those Petitions are extremely difficult to get approved. Um, although you can, it's it's not 100% that it would get denied, but you know you definitely have to talk to an attorney and make sure the proper um, documents were submitted. But in general, it is for professionals, bachelors, masters, or even higher potentially if required for the position. Okay, uh, and then um, going with that, uh, what is the H-1B lottery? and how does it impact uh, uh, clients' companies or their companies? And this is for uh, Anthony. Anthony, we can't hear you. <laughs> doing, doing too many things today. Um, so what are, um, the H-1B lottery is a system that was set up um, by the government, the USCIS, in order to handle the extraordinary amount or number of applications filed. Uh, to give you an example, this past year, uh, there was over 300,000 applications for just 85,000 visas that are issued each year. So um, in order to handle that, instead of you know, picking and choosing or showing favoritism, the government came up with a lottery system. And basically, what the government does now is they create um, a registration process. All the employers uh, sign up for the registration process. And then uh, once they are registered and in this pool, 
mid-March, they'll put them in this big pot. And just like a lottery, they'll pick out the number of visas that they need. Now, it's not exactly 85,000. They're going to choose a little bit more because there's a, a pretty much a consistent denial rate. They know that a certain number of those visas are going to be denied, so they choose a little bit more. Now, this number is uh, public information and is always put on the USCIS website. So you can always check that out. But just to give you an example, 300,000, 85,000 slots, you're looking at roughly, I think it came out to maybe 27 um, percent. Someone in the comments can do the math for us and, <laughs> and let us know. So, but that's, um, and how does that impact companies? Basically, um, it's not really a good process for companies. Um, if you're um, like an IT firm and you're playing your odds, then, you know, if you only need five people and you know it's 25%, then, you know, you'll put out, you know, more than that in order to get your 25% or increase your odds. Whereas a lot of employers just file for that key employee, that one employee that they like. So unfortunately, for those who do not play the odds of this lottery game, then um, you could really lose out because you only have one engineer. And if that engineer is not selected, unfortunately, you have to wait until the next year. So it really can impact um, how things um, U.S. employers in many ways. This is just one way that it impacts employers. The nice thing about employer for employers is you don't have to, you know, put everything together and pay the full fee. So to get into this registration or this lottery system, it's really going to save the employer a lot more money, especially because they only have to pay ten dollars in order to um, submit. So it only costs employers to do $10, $10. That's why you're seeing $300,000, three, excuse me, 300,000 plus applications being filed. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so I think, uh, thank you, JJ, for uh, your comment. Um, I'm assuming you're asking for processing times uh, for the EB3 or just generally. Uh, so uh, I, uh, Lauren or Anthony can um, answer that for you um, just either generally the EB3 visa or I think more specifically, maybe the processing times. Yeah. So again, like Hogan said, thanks for your comments. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Um, for the EB3 process, this would be for a more permanent um, immigrant visa. Um, so that would be your employer files an immigrant petition in the EB3 category, which is also a professional. So basically, uh, it can be a bachelor's degree, it can be skilled, which um, is experience, and then there's an unskilled category. Uh, this follows a number of a uh, number of people can can qualify for EB3. Um, for Indian specifically, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the backlogs are extreme. So, um, you know, with the H-1B, basically what your employer would do is just file that first step, which would be the immigrant petition. Uh, once you get the I-140 immigrant petition approved, uh, you're then able to extend your H-1B uh, basically indefinitely until such time as your priority date is current, which for some people have been waiting like 10 years, they're finally uh, moving the numbers a little bit. Uh, so some people are able to finally file for their actual green card. But in general, that would be the process for EB3. If you have more specific questions, definitely let us know. Um, if you guys want to say hi, let us know that we're not alone. Uh, that'd be great too. We're happy to, to see your emojis. <laughs> And thumbs up. Um, so the, the next question uh, we have uh, is, uh, how is wage determined in an H-1B case? Um, it's more for... Yeah, so uh, basically what we'd have to do is um, submit a labor condition application to the Department of Labor. Um, it's a pretty simple form. Basically, we put in some information about the petition, or sorry, about your position. Um, what's the job title? What is the occupational category? Meaning if you're a software developer, we'd put that. If you are an engineer, let's say you're an industrial engineer, what's the general category? Um, and then we put in your location. Uh, so the Department of Labor can say, hey, you know, for people with this category and um, this location, generally the 
the wage one, two, three, or four, um, what your salary would fall under. Um, so we would submit that labor condition application. Usually it's certified within seven days and we submit that certified document uh, with your H-1B petition. Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, this next question, um, I think Billy Anthony previously touched on it, uh, but I think it's gonna be more detailed. Um, how many H-1B visas are issued each year uh, by the USCIS? Excellent question. So um, before we dive into the number, a lot of uh, people feel that, oh, all these you know foreign nationals are coming in and taking jobs. Well, unfortunately, if you look at the numbers, it's really small, very insignificant. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at creating jobs of 250 new jobs each month, um, and for the H-1B, as I mentioned earlier, there's only 85,000, I mean, that's like 10, 17%. It's not a huge number. That leaves a lot of jobs for U.S. citizens to take. Um, and also, as you everyone knows, there's a lot of job opportunities out there right now in various sectors. Of course, it depends on what sector you're in. Now, as for the H-1B, um, as I mentioned, there's a total of 85,000, 85, but it doesn't mean that everyone gets a shot at that 85,000. The 85,000 is split into a couple ways. First, the first split is between the 65,000, which is the general H-1B category, anyone generally who is a professional, usually with a uh, four-year degree or higher, or sometimes um, a combination. And then there's 20,000 set aside for those who have advanced degrees or US master's degrees, okay? So um, nowadays, you know, that 20,000 is really small and insignificant. Um, everyone went out and got their US master's degree right away when that way it gives them more chances or the opportunity to get that H-1B. But the 65,000 is broken into um, even a smaller category, um, there are specific H-1Bs which are set aside for individuals or professionals from Chile and also Singapore. So there's a small number. Now, thankfully, there's not a lot of people coming from Chile and Singapore eating up a lot of the H-1B numbers. So generally, you know, there's always one, there's always an H-1B for those individuals. However, uh, you can really just look at it as 65,000 for the general category um, and then uh, 20,000 for the advanced degrees or U.S. master's degree. So 85,000 altogether. Remember the fiscal year for the government is from October 1st to September 30th. We're coming up on that new fiscal, well, sorry, we just started the new fiscal year uh, for uh, 2022 for the government. And um, this has implications not just for the H-1B, but as everyone may have heard, um, you know, the uh, numbers for the H-2B um, for the first half has already been hit. So there's a huge demand for workers right now. We get calls pretty much daily of how to bring people in and get workers in. Uh, so, you know, we all need to get back out there and work um, and us employers need to do what we can to hire and get those and find those people or the government needs to open up opportunities for more visas of, to let people in so that we can meet our demand. So. That's my answer to that. <laughs> uh, the ne next one's more of a process question, but um, and it's for Lauren, uh, what forms are typically used in when filing an H-1B filing? So you would use uh, the form I-129. Uh, there's a few parts to that. It's the regular I-129, the I-129H supplement, as well as the I-129 data collection supplement, so I-129H and I-129DC. Uh, you would then submit your LCA as well, um, and employer support letter is usually included. Uh, and then if you have an attorney, a G28, if you use premium processing, uh, which would get your petition back in 15 days, or a response, I should say, in 15 days, uh, that would be the form I-907. Well, thank you. Um, and then uh, we have another question from JJ. Um, I think it's directed towards Lauren. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can I enter the United States by taking a job offer itself while EB3 unskilled visa I-140 pending uh, from India? Um, uh, so that would depend. Uh, you would need uh, some sort of visa. Um, 
to enter while you're uh, waiting for your priority date is current. Um, so that would you would need a dual intent visa, which would mean that the uh, immigration will allow you to intend to take this non-immigrant visa, so like something like an L, um, and also have the intent to later immigrate once your priority date is current. Um, so you could also enter the U.S. on a B-1 if you couldn't work, you would take like, meetings or trainings, um, or if you wanted to just come in for tourist purposes, you can come in on the B-2. Uh, as long as you can convince the official at the airport, the CBP officer, which is Customs and Border Protection or Border Patrol, that you do intend to leave the U.S. once your uh, validity date is expired. So your I-94, that time that you get to enter the U.S. Um, so it really depends on if you could obtain some sort of other visa to enter while you're waiting for your priority date to become current. So you would have to talk to your employer, see what you can do with that, um, and you know potentially talk to an attorney to make sure that everything's done properly. Oh, very, very important. Um, so then uh, the next one we have, um, is uh can i file for an h1b visa directly at the u.s embassy and i'll take this one um so the h1b unlike other visa categories does not allow you to apply directly to the u.s embassy uh several visa categories such as the e visas um allow you to file directly or if you have an approved blanket petition l1b blanket petition then the then the employee can petition directly with the u.s embassy unfortunately um with the h1b process you must first there's a two-step approval process first you got to get approved here in the united states and then you then go abroad and get your h1b visa stamp uh, with the U.S. Embassy. Now, um, with that process in the U.S., uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that works in the U.S. But typically, in a majority of the cases, once you're approved in the U.S., it should be, you know, not a problem to get that H-1B visa stamp. Now, there's a caveat to that. We have a lot of clients, for example, if you're working at a third party location or need in client, um, you know, India, for example, and a few other countries, you might get a heightened scrutiny or more questions. So it may not be as automatic. However, what we have found is with proper preparation and all the correct documentation, updating the in client letter or updating employer support letters and having everything up to date will improve that. Um, uh, proficiency and getting approved and going through that process so you're not stressed out. But um, I would say for our firm, you know, 99% of the times our clients do not have issues. Most of them take care of it on their own, um, you know, in India, but in other countries that we handle, we have no issues whatsoever when it comes to H-1Bs at the consulates. Okay, um, so the next one I have, um, so uh, there's a lot of filing fees for a lot of immigration processes, but specifically, uh, what should the, what are the filing fees for an employer be ready to pay in regards to the H-1B process? Uh, this one uh, is for, oh, I think I skipped one. Sorry, uh, is there a limit on the number of H-1B employees we can hire at a company? Um, short answer, no, <laughs> there is not. You can hire as many H&B employees as you'd like. Um, if you are, we'll talk about possibly this later, H-1B dependent, meaning you have a majority H-1B employees, um, you know, there could be additional fees you may have to pay, but no, there is no limit on H-1B employees that you can hire. Um, just, Hogan, before you continue on that, um, just some things, um, I our clients have not experienced this, but I have heard certain situations, especially in India, uh, because of the high number of visas being issued, uh, the U.S. Embassy in India may at times limit certain visa, uh, the number of certain visas a company can issue. Now, that was probably a few years ago. I'm not sure if they continue that practice, but in practice, there is no limitation on the number of H-1B employees an employer can sponsor and bring along, as long as there's work available. Uh, 
All right. One more time. Mute off. So uh, an important difference, um, I think, being impractical and then what, what's supposed to happen, two different realities. Uh, so the, the next question, um, what, uh, what fees are, should an employer expect to pay uh, when filing an H-1B uh, filing? Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, so um, in this process, um, the um, Lauren touched on the filing fees, um, um, what those were and specifically, um, but there's the whole question of, you know, should the employer pay it? Now, it is the best practice that the employer pay those filing fees and legal fees. Um, it's very uncommon for, you know, everyday Americans to, you know, pay for fees for them to get the job. Um, so in this process, that visa is necessary. The employer is benefiting from that visa. So the employer really should be paying um, the filing fees and the legal fees as it goes through that process. Now, both the problem we have is the Department of Labor and the USCIS has their own rules on who should pay what or what the employer must pay. Whereas the Department of Labor takes a very, very strong stance where the employer should pay for everything. And the USCIS is not as strong, um, you know, only requiring certain fees be paid. So in order for the employer to have the best practices, um, the employer should, um, um, <clears throat> the employer should um, go ahead and pay for those fees. And that way, if the company is ever checked by the Department of Labor, more so than the USCIS, they're going to be able to be in a good position and document everything and say, like, hey, yeah, we took care of everything. Everything is on the up and up. Uh, alternatively, if you don't do that, you could have the Department of Labor look into that and question that and assess any fines or penalties. Um, and um, yeah. All right. Hold on just a second. And we were just talking about the limit. I'll let Lauren talk about the number of H-1Bs uh, for large companies and everything. She'll touch on that uh, when, it, when it's her time again. But as far as what the employer should pay, employer should pay everything. And that way it's best. Um, so for us employers, you know, factor that into the cost of what you're paying your employee. Make sure you pay them above the prevailing wage and you're good to go. Thank you. Um... Okay, so uh, Lauren, did you want to uh, add to that uh, what Anthony's uh, comment was um, for the yeah. limit for large <clears throat> companies? Yeah, so in general, the filing fees would be, uh, the base filing fee is 460. Um, if you're doing a transfer or a new petition, that'd be an additional 500. Depending on the size, you would then also, for a first extension or transfer new petition, pay 750 or $1,500. Um, and then right. if you also are a very large company and you are H-1B dependent, you would also pay an additional 4,000. Um, there is the option for premium processing, which I believe Hogan was going to ask me next. So I'll just go ahead and answer that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the premium processing fee is always going up. Uh, currently it is $2,500. Um, and again, that would mean that USCIS would respond to your position in 15 days. Our response is into guaranteed approval. Uh, they could issue a request for additional evidence. And once you respond to that request for additional evidence, they would have another 15 days to respond, but still a very useful thing, although it is expensive. Um, now, premium processing is the one exception to uh, the employer has to pay. Uh, premium processing is totally optional. You do not have to do premium processing. Therefore, the beneficiary can elect to pay that fee if they really want to and the employer does not feel like paying that additional 2500 the beneficiary can cut the check for premium processing again because it is a totally optional service thank you um i think for uh the premium processing um since it is a big fee how much time would it cut since it is 15 days how much would it be regularly with if i someone wasn't to pay the premium processing. Yeah, so again, that would depend on the service center. 
Um, each service center has slightly different processing times. However, in general, they have gotten a little bit better for H-1Bs right now. Um, it could be three months. It could be up to maybe eight months. I would say probably more like six months, but it would depend on the service center and that individual officer. Some may even take longer. These are always changing. So in a couple months, they could be faster or they could be way slower. They're kind of trending slower right now. So probably budget a lot of time. Yeah, I was, I'm just jumping in. Everyone had hoped with a new administration that we would see some improvement in processing times, but I don't think we've really seen that, have we, Lauren? Some H-1Bs have been approved pretty quickly. I don't know if that's just the newer cases they're trying to prioritize since they're saying, oh, well, those other people have waited a long time anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, some of the new cases still seems to get stuck. It, I always tell yeah. people it really depends on that individual officer who's handling your case there's no way we can know how that op- how much work that officer has. Are they taking a leave or something? Um, you know, cases do sometimes get stuck, um, and there's there's certain things we can do to follow up. But you know, in general, USCIS just gives a posted generic processing times, uh, and if it's outside of that generic processing time, then we can can follow up and, and see what's going on. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the next question I have um, for Anthony, if my H-1B petition is denied, uh, what should I do? All right. Well, hopefully this doesn't happen to you um, if this is your situation. Um, always stay engaged um, on your H-1B petition. Never take it for granted. Um, you know, all too often we have attorneys who just focus on representing the employers, but don't care too much about the beneficiary. And we have to realize that when an H-1B gets denied, this really impacts not just a visa being denied, but a family, a livelihood, uh, people's careers. So at our firm, we really, really do take this seriously. Um, And we avoid this at all costs. And we give our clients the warning. So warnings if there's issues with the H-1B before we even file. So um, if your H-1B is unfortunately denied, what should you do? First, um, figure out what kind of H-1B you were filing. Was it H-1B cap? Was it a transfer? Was it an extension? Do you still have enough time on your existing H-1B I-94 example? You know, the key is you always want to maintain your status, okay? So figure out how you can maintain your status. That way uh, you don't have other or future immigration problems. The next thing you can look at, you can look at, um, there are a couple options such as a motion to reopen, um, a motion to reconsider, or you can appeal. All right. Uh, Those are the three main ones. And on our YouTube um, channel, we have videos that goes into details into all of these things. So please, please check out our YouTube channel. We've got um, information even on that EB3 on the perm process. So check those out. I go into we all go into detail about these things. Um, So feel free to check that out because we won't have enough time to discuss it today. But those are the three options you can do. But Before you even decide which of those three are your options, you have to wait for the decision. Now that decision normally comes in the mail about a week afterwards. And you're gonna have to look and see why it was denied. Was it denied, for example, because um, the employer doesn't have the ability to pay? Was it denied because um, there was a problem in the actual filing, you know? Uh, Was it denied because the position was not a professional occupation? Uh, There could be multiple reasons for the denial, and you really got to look and see what the USCIS has a problem with before you take that next action. If it's something that was missing, you can correct that quickly, file a motion to reconsider, or a motion to reopen, submit whatever information or explanation is required, and go ahead and get it approved. But in most cases, you want to avoid this before. I mean, really good attorneys are going to, you know, go through your case, talk about these issues beforehand, so you're not faced with the denial. But those are some options that you can take in the event that your H-1B is denied. All right, Hogan, off mute. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was very, very detailed. Um, and then uh, JJ just uh, said, uh, when we were talking about priority dates, it's uh, above 10 years for, for Indian nationals, uh, which is short <laughs> in, in, in most cases. Um, and uh, the next question I have is for uh, Lauren. Um, so it's this is more of a technical question. I was told by my company that uh, is H-1B dependent. Uh, what does that mean, being H-1B dependent? Yeah, so H-1B dependent just means that the company has a certain threshold of H-1B workers versus regular um uh, U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident or maybe even other type of visa workers. Um, so it depends on how many workers that the company has as well. Um, if you have the company has 25 or fewer employees and at least eight are in, on H-1B status, H-1B dependent, uh, 26 to 50 employees, uh, at least 13 uh, H-1B workers would make the company H-1B dependent. Uh, 51 or more workers, 15% uh, of uh, your workforce would have to be on H-1B status in order to be considered H-1B dependent. Now, those are all considering these people are full-time, um, part-time would be different. So in general, you know, you can just go on Google. There's a really easy fact sheet you can find pretty easily or consult your attorney, obviously, to figure out if you're H-1B dependent it's important to know because that would impact the filing fees for each of your petitions. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so getting more into the, the details here, uh, for Anthony, um, are H-1Bs only for professionals? All right. So the answer is no, of course, H-1Bs. Um, what's really fascinating about immigration is uh, if you take the alphabet and go from A all the way down to U or V, um, you know, there's a visa category for everything. And even within the H category for H, the letter H, there's multiple ones, um, H1Bs, H2As, H2Bs, um, you know, there's a lot of sub uh Categories Now, under the H-1B, there are two other categories, which we haven't really talked about today. Um, those are for uh, fashion, um, sorry, uh, fashion models of, um, you know, significant um, achievements. Um, so certain models that come over a lot, of course, New York, California, um, they're, and who are known internationally, they're going to be able to get an H-1B and come over and work in their profession as a model. So um, those are really good categories for models They're, that was carved out for them. Um, the other category, uh, which we don't see too much, but is for the Department of Defense. Um, if the Department of Defense needs certain key individuals to work for them, um, they will bring them over under an H-1B. There's a specific number carved out and um, those are separate from the 85,000 that we talked about. Um, so they come under a different category. So if you're a model um, or if, you know, let, you know, Phil to re reach out to us, feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll help you with that process with, um, with your agent or agency. And the Department of Defense, obviously, they're going to take care of their own visas and bringing their professionals over because that's internal. And, um, you know, they want to keep that within the government. So. Thank you. Um, so then the next question uh, for Lauren, um, explain the cap gap uh, to someone uh, that doesn't know what that is. Sure. So if someone, let's say, most commonly would be on, let's say, F1 status, um, their status is going to end at the end of the school year, which would be May or June, right? Um, but if the H-1B lottery was in March, if that person is selected, well, what do they do between May, June and the start date, which is October 1st? That's for all H-1B candidates, after you're selected in the lottery, your official start date would be October 1st, because that's the new fiscal year for USCIS. 
so the cap gap simply means that you are automatically going to have your status extended until October 1st. Now you're not going to start working on H-1B status until October 1st, but you will be authorized to stay. Uh, your CVIS record and your university will update that um, to say that you're still current until October 1st. So uh, talk to your university about that and it's very useful, makes, makes it so that you don't have to go home to your home country. If Obviously, if you want to, you're more than welcome to and you can re-enter uh, with an H-1B visa stamp, but if you don't want to, it's too much of a hassle, you can stay in the U.S. for those few months until you start on H-1B status. Thank you. That's, that, that's why it's important to ask questions, um, especially with complicated concepts. Um, so the next one uh, for Anthony, um, when should I start the process for initial H-1B CAP subject candidates? Excellent. Good question. So, um, for those employers out there and for employees, um, even if you're a student in F1, um, for those initial CAP cases, um, a lot of firms, depending on the number of H-1Bs they're filing, uh, they can start processing or preparing for H-1Bs from anywhere from December till up until March. Now, the process is a lot different now because we do have this lottery system at the registration stage only and that gives us a little bit more leeway. But still, we need to make sure that we have qualified individuals. There's no need to do a registration um, um, if they don't even qualify from the beginning. So there's a, not a lot of analysis and review that really needs to go on before you just pick anyone off the streets um, or an engineer or IT person, doctor or lawyer or accountant. You want to make sure they meet all those requirements. So. Our firm, typically, we start reaching out to our clients in January or February to see what they're, what they're looking for and what their prospects are. Um, then we collect that information on questionnaires and documents, and we want to make sure that all our candidates are um, ready to go um, by the beginning of March. So at the beginning of March, we know our numbers, we make sure everyone is qualified, we make sure they're in the system ready to go when it opens. And when it opens, we get everyone in that system and ready because that window for the lottery for the cap season is really short. I mean, you know, Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, usually we have less than 20, 25 days in order to get everything in. And if you can imagine, you know, that's 85,000 visas available, but remember there's 300,000 people who signed up for the registration. So that's a lot of, you know, numbers and things going into the system all at once. Also, um, I don't think we've, you know, faced this too much last or this year, but sometimes, you know, systems break down and um, you have to be prepared for that, that maybe the system's overloaded and you have to wait or maybe you have to do it at night in order to make sure that you get your registration in. So when to start the process, the earlier the better um, is, of course, but sometimes people don't know. One last thing, uh, for those who are in F1 status, you have to make sure that your degree was earned um, by the time that you file the H1B. So the good thing about this is you can get registered and not yet have earned your degree, and we can wait and file your H1B petition at the end of June, which will give you a lot more time. So just because you won't graduate or earn your degree as of March or by the end of March, you still could be in the running. And remember, it's 10 bucks to the employer. So, um, you know, if you need workers um, or you have qualified people that you want to file for, get them into this lottery because this could be a really make the difference for employers and their business to grow and expand, especially um, in this tough time as we find qualified workers in uh, a number of fields. Yep, thank you, Anthony. Um, it's a lot of information there. Uh, so the next question uh, for Lauren, um, since we've been talking about the cap, um, are all H-1B cases subject to H-1B cap? Uh, no. The vast majority, yes. However, there are some exceptions. If you are going to work for a nonprofit, um, certain nonprofits do not have to file under the H-1B cap. You can work directly for that nonprofit. Um, universities, 
can hire you directly without the H-1B cap, um, or, you know, there are certain nonprofits that work with universities. Again, Anthony already mentioned uh, the Department of Defense. Um, there's also, you know, allotted numbers for Singapore and Chile um, that don't fall under that regular H-1B cap lottery. Um, so for the people who, let's say you want to work for a university or some other sort of nonprofit, um, yes, you can work for those directly without filing under the cap. However, if you then want to transfer to another company that is subject to the cap, you still would at that point have to undergo the H&B cap lottery. So something to keep in mind um, if you do start working for a university or nonprofit. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we previously briefly talked about processing times, uh, but specifically for in, uh, what are the processing times for initial H-1B cap cases for Anthony? Okay, the nice thing about um, this um, category, I know Lauren had touched on those, follow her processing times. Um, but the nice thing about H-1B cap case uh, processing times is it's going to be split up. So um, generally when you file, you have 90 days once your case is selected. And, you ha and once it's filed within that 90 days, then you have to wait for them to process Premium processing is, is the best way to go. Yes, it's expensive, but you have certainty in your case. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of the USCIS. And as Lauren had mentioned, that processing time can vary. Um, I often tell people you should budget for six to nine months. It may come a little early, um, hopefully never too late. Also, um, as she mentioned, an RFE may impact the overall processing time. Um, but most of our H-1Bs this year um, were approved you know, well before October 1st, and which was great. Um, they're all set and ready to go. But um, what happened again this year is, um, you know, they didn't have enough H-1B, so they drew a few more people. Um, and we had a good bunch of people who were also selected, I believe it was August, Lauren, you can correct me. Um, and those are actually been filed and um, we're gonna, um, you know, see how long it takes the government to process those, okay? But anyways, um, hold on, let's see. Okay, you can, you can go to the question in the chat if you want. Okay, you're on mute. Oh, so uh, we have another question from JJ. Uh, uh, to apply for an EB3 B visa, which status is needed, uh, TRC? Uh, or citizenship. Um, not sure what TRC is. Um, you want me to answer this one? Yeah, I'm not sure what TRC. Yeah, you can look it up. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just start off. But um, to generally to apply for the EB3 visa, EB3 visa is normally it's normally not a visa per se. It's actually the green card or the third employment based green card process. So terminology here, I'm just not clear. You can always send up a follow-up to make clarification, but I think it's in reference to the green card. So with the EB3 category, it, you don't have to be in a status. You could be in your home country and the U.S. employer can file for you. This happens many times with, for example, uh, chefs for certain restaurants like French restaurants or Japanese restaurants. Um, you know, they can... Um, file and then two or three later they come in with their green card and start working for the um um for um, that employer um you do not need to be a citizen um i mean if you're a u.s citizen you wouldn't even need the visa so that's not applicable um lauren did you have anything uh temporary so you said temporary resident jj i'm not sure if you mean temporary resident of india or Indian citizenship, um, definitely feel free to give us a call. We do have free 15 minute consultations. Mm -hmm. um, so then maybe we could talk a little bit more about your situation, your employer, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, but typically temporary green cards, just to let Gigi know, basically that's only applicable for um, those married to a US citizen for less than three years or under the EB-5 category. 
um, if you're investing uh, $1.8 million or $900,000 under that category. All right, Hogan, take it us away. What's the next okay. one? Um, th thank you, JJ, for all your questions and clarifications. Uh, please feel free to call us, uh, like Lauren indicated. So then uh, the next question um, for Lauren, uh, what advice would you give to employers and HR um, about the H-1B process? Like what would be the things to do, what things not to do when you're in the process? Um, in general, give us all the information early as possible, uh, provide all the documents as early as possible. Uh, you may need an educational evaluation, you may need an experience evaluation, um, you, you know, any issue could come up, we, we just don't know. So the earlier you start would definitely be better. Um, you know, also making sure that the beneficiaries are clear as to what the entire process is, what they can expect, just so there's no confusion, things like the cap gap. Um, obviously, you know, these are people's lives on the line, so people can get really anxious, definitely understandably. So just being clear and upfront about everything as soon as possible. Um, like Anthony said, we usually advise, if you can, file for premium processing. It's going to avoid a lot of issues running out of, you know, time to work. We don't want you to have issues working. Uh, people's driver's license, a lot of states are having issues or giving our beneficiaries issues with renewing their driver's license. So having that approval is really going to help that person get that full three-year uh, driver's license as opposed to getting only a few months extension at a time. Maybe the Secretary of State is going to deny the driver's license. Then your 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 uh, your employees panicking, things like that. So um, that would generally be my advice. Maybe Anthony has some other ones, but in general, that would be apply early and make everything. Oh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, so very, very important people uh, give documents early on uh, instead of last minute. Uh, but the next question uh, I have for uh, Anthony is, um, what is a specialty occupation for an H-1B visa? So um, I was just joking, Lauren was talking. You can see we're hard at work. We've got people working behind Hogan. So we're working on your cases. <laughs> Um, or maybe just some employees wanted to get on the live stream to see what was going on, but they didn't want to show their face. Anyways, what are some of the common issues that you see in H-1B? Um, so as Lauren mentioned, um, a lot of the things that we face um, um, go beyond just immigration. Um, but you know, often within immigration, we'll talk about that first real quick, is basically people are just not qualified. You know, you try to, you know, fit, um, you know, a round peg into a square, you know, fitting, you just can't do it. And as much as you want to bring that person over, the law just doesn't allow or provide for that. So sometimes that's an issue. Normally we are able to convince clients to not pursue those cases, uh, realize bringing H-1B holders, H-1B um, holders over, you know, it's easily costs employers 5000 each at least. And so it's a huge investment. And when we talk about other visa categories, such as the E and L, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars of bringing these foreign nationals over. So, you know, it's a huge cost uh, to the company. But, um, you know, there's a need. There's a reason for that. So one of the issues is, of course, um, you know, just being qualified for it. Second, we see sometimes, not always, but sometimes the employer's ability to pay. Often we'll have startups that are um, just starting or they want to do the green card process. You know, maybe they just, you know, open shop, they have a good investment, but they don't have the resources or the financial history. Um, normally those are not stumbling blocks, but those are, um, you know, things that we do face. Next um, is timing. I always say timing is crucial. One of the most important things, meeting the client's expectation of when you want that person to start. Now, with the H-1B, you know, you got to, you file in April, 
you know, we start the process even earlier, and then they don't even start working until October. That's a huge, huge time gap. So does the employer have the resources to, you know, take that um, to survive or do business until that time? So those are huge issues. Another issue, as Lauren had mentioned, there are things that are beyond immigration, such as driver's licenses and um if sometimes we have um, foreign governments, embassies not issuing passports or certain documents we need in order to satisfy certain requests. Um, you know, once in a while, um, some people may have some minor criminal backgrounds, such as DUIs or retail fraud or something like that, that we have to address. But most of those things that we face, we, you know, really work hard with our clients to overcome those. So those are some of the common issues um, that you will see on H-1B cases. But normally we have a very great screening process and, um, you know, the cases that we file, we see a high success rate and our clients are very, very uh, satisfied with the results that they get. Yeah, and that, that's why it's very, very important to work with someone that knows and realizes all these issues, especially uh, a law firm. Um, they can just guide you through the process and all these common issues that they commonly deal with. Mm -hmm. um, you want me to wrap up? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I mean, unless there's anything else, Lauren, did you have anything you wanted to add on H-1Bs from our discussion? <clears throat> um. No, not really. I definitely, you know, especially if it's there is a lot of more scrutiny, it seems on certain occupational categories. Uh, if you work with an attorney, they're going to likely know this uh, so they can kind of help guide you. A lot of the occupational categories are similar. Also, maybe your employer thinks that your education is related. USCIS may think otherwise. So honestly, with this category, it is really important to have a consultation with an attorney and make sure that everything's filed properly. If it's not filed properly, you know, they will RFE request, give you a request for evidence and you can respond to that, but often that makes it a lot more difficult. It's a lot easier if you file everything up front to avoid issues, an attorney can really help with that. All right. So um, to everyone out there, we want to thank you for your time, uh, for joining us. If there is something that you want us to speak on or you find of interest or, hey, you're just curious about, visit our YouTube channel, but also put some comments in, the, um, in there. If this has been helpful, just let us know, um, you know, and, you know, we'll see about putting more of these out there to the community. Um, and we want to make sure that the information we're putting out there is helpful and insightful and can help you make that next step on your immigration journey. So from uh, Ray, on behalf of Ray Law International, we thank you for your time and we'll see you, okay? Thank you.